it should start coming up here in just a bit. It takes it a while for it to fetch the video stream. There we go. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. So we are now live and I'm gonna wait just a couple minutes and then I'll start my end of things. So are we just cycling through all of our webcams as that was happening? Yeah, so in a minute, um, so we're custom, yeah, we're, we're streaming, so we should be in good shape or that's concern. Um, and we have a few people watching us already. Okay, so. Um, I'm gonna wait one more minute. I'll start with an overall introduction. I'll kick it over to you, Sarah, and then I will spotlight Hal's video and I will mute all of us. Okay. And Sue, if you can just keep an eye on Facebook okay. and Sarah. Yeah, what does it want to pop up for me? It's um, not coming up? Yeah, just let, let me... Uh... Are, are you seeing it, Sarah? Yeah, I see it. Okay. okay. So all it's right, right oh, you know in... Yeah. Um, I went and in... I re... I logged back in. I logged out, logged back into my Facebook. Yeah. So it's my yeah. end of it. That it was. should be under discussion. Like there's a little yeah. spot down there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, it popped up after I logged back in. So oh, perfect. Tripti's here. Tripti says Yay. hello. Hey, Hi, hello. Yep, <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Literally, I'm going to wait one minute just so I'm on time. And oh, it's cycling uh, through all of our tiny little faces. <laughs> yeah. It, it'll stop doing that once I, uh, yeah. I spotlight um, how. how. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave it like this for just the introductions and then I'll spotlight how. All right, literally coming up on 1.30 in about 20 seconds. Precision of digital time. <laughs> I'm so impressed with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I hope you're joining us via Facebook. Um, I'm just gonna offer just a, a few uh, preliminary comments on uh, accessing this talk and uh, what this talk uh, is uh, framed by, if you will, in terms of our programs at Coastal Carolina University. And then uh, at the end of the talk, this will be available as a video in several, in several places. Um, so uh, we all want to encourage you to use this as a teaching tool. We all know the, the downsides of a digital culture at this moment, but one of the advantages is that we can do the kinds of things that we're doing today and that we can use them as teaching tools. Uh, we're very excited about this talk. It's part of uh, a series. I'll give you just a very brief background on that before we go into the introduction of our fabulous speaker today. Um, our first uh, real uh, foray into this, both the QEP project, the Commons for um, the Humanities and Arts at Coastal Carolina University and the program Digital Culture and Design, uh, did a collaboration with um, what is called AGEP at Coastal a couple of years back uh, which is the uh, Arts and Humanities Global Experience uh, Program that's actually directed by Dr. Tripthi Pillay. Uh, that collaboration was not only interdisciplinary, but it was international. We had several speakers. We did that on site in the commons where students uh, could watch virtually. It was such a success. And of course, we were able to spare some carbon and some expense in bringing people into one place. And so we were able to feature literally people from uh, scholars from all over the, the world giving us talks on uh, the connection or the intersections between the digital and the global. And since then, we've now uh, turned this into a smaller uh, virtual speaker series. Our last one of these, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Sue Bergeron's uh, connection with uh, Amy Green, was a talk on video games, narratives, uh, trauma, and masculinity. Uh, and uh, at the end of this talk, I will post the link to the website. You'll be able to access the Digital Global Symposium, that former virtual speaker's talk, and this one uh, as soon as we get it posted. Uh, so we're very excited about this virtual speaker series. We're excited to be able to offer these um, 
Coastal Carolina University, and in particular the uh, College of Humanities, Edwards College of Humanities, is really dedicated to trying to make these kinds of opportunities available at this moment. And so with that, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Sarah Leola to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Um, am I on or is it you? <laughs> Sorry. You were on, but okay, uh, I, yeah, and I will, let, let me just say real quickly too, uh, I, I meant to mention before, um, and let me go ahead and make sure that we are fully recording at this point. Uh, and I just want to mention too, now that we've done sort of basic introductions and we're starting the actual talk itself, we do want to encourage uh, questions at the end. Uh, but we'd like to wait to the end to do that. So you, if you're watching on Facebook, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions and we'll field those right into this space uh, so that Dr. Lawrence uh, can address them. All right, Sarah, Dr. Lawrence, well, <laughs> Dr. Yeah, Leon. No, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I am um, thrilled to get to introduce um, and bring Dr. Halsey and Lawrence to this um, speaker series today. Um, Dr. Lawrence is an assistant professor of technical communication and information design at Towson University. Um, she has over 20 years of professional experience as a technical trainer and usability practitioner. Um, and her research focuses on speech intelligibility and the design of speech interactions for voice technologies, um, particularly with attention to underrepresented user populations. She has an upcoming publication titled Siri Disciplines in an edited collection um, with the best name, Your Computer is on Fire, which <laughs> is under contract with MIT Press and due out, um, I guess later, this, is it out now, Hal, or later this year? It's in this year, yeah. Okay, yeah, I was like, wait, that date's wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so due out, uh, my date says 2019, so that's obviously okay. false. Um, mm -hmm. So later this year, and we can all look for that um, fantastic collection and um, Dr. Lawrence's work there. So um, today, thank you so much again for joining us for her talk. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get that. How the design of speech recognition technologies reinforces accent bias. All right, see you, Hal. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I just wanna thank, um, thank you all for joining us today. I am really excited about the opportunity to talk about what has become um, just really personal work. Um, and quite often uh, we recognize that research comes through personal experience. And I'm gonna share some of those personal experiences with you. But I just wanted to say a little bit about what I do. Um, Sarah mentioned that my, uh, my position is um, in the area of technical communication and information design. And if you're wondering what that is, I, in my research and in my teaching, I think a lot about how we design information. My field has done an amazing job of coming up with and, and thinking about standards for the way that we communicate text and the way that we communicate visuals. Uh, one of the areas that I have been pushing our field of technical communication towards is thinking about the design of sound, the sonic design, how, and if it is possible for speech and for sound to have a design element. Um, how I became interested in the work that I'm gonna share with you today really came out of a series of, of incidences that happened over a couple of years. I am from Trinidad and Tobago. It is the suddenly most um, island Twin Island uh, uh, in the Caribbean. And I moved to Chicago in, in 2008 to work on my PhD. And up until that time, I never had a problem with anybody understanding what I said. And I, I, I come to the, the US and not only do I have now challenges with communicating as a native speaker of English, but I'm also considered a minority. And I keep thinking, how did that happen? <laughs> it was just like a five hour flight. So all of a sudden issues of identity um, that were related to my, my speech and to my language sort of became really important to me. And one of, the, one of sort of the major turning points was understanding that the kinds of experiences 
that I had in the physical world, in my daily experiences with people, I was not experiencing in the digital realm. And what I mean by that is if I was in a conversation with someone and they perhaps did not understand something that I was saying, I could negotiate that. I, I could say it differently, a different turn of phrase. I could slow my speech down. There were all of these clear speech strategies that I could employ. Well, technology doesn't allow me to do that. There is no negotiation that happens. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples in a little while of my regular battle with Alexa. <laughs> um, I think the other thing that, that struck me when I was working on my, my PhD is that whereas my field of technical communication had worked so hard to come up with standards for text and standards for visuals that we see around us to make textual and visual communication clearer. No such standards for sonic design exist. It's one of the reasons, for example, that you can still be in an airport in 2020 and not understand what's being said on the public address system. It's, it's the reason that if a, a conductor comes on a train and says something through the PA system, we still don't understand what's being said because there are no standards for the design of speech and sound. Um, the aha moment for me was my mother calling me from Trinidad one year and saying that the credit card company indicated that I had eight, eight transactions on my credit card. And I thought, surely I've been hacked. I had not used my credit card like that. And so I make a series of calls, overseas calls, to find out that what the recording actually said is that there was a one transaction. And it got me thinking that it would have been easier if they had said one transaction. And that we often do not think about how we can design speech in a way that allows um, users to be able to communicate effectively. So this, way, this is where my research started. In the last year, I have been spending with Alexa and I wanna share with you a couple of things that um, Alexa allows me to do and does not allow me to do. So in my last year with Alexa, my shopping list includes four whole human beings. For example, instead of the word hanger, um, Alexa has added hanger. Um, she's ordered trees, seed covers, and the entire city of Reno. And you can see those listed here um, on my shopping list. I cannot set an alarm um, using Alexa for half past the hour. So if I try to say set an alarm for 6.30, she often hears it as 50. And so I've been sleeping in late. Um, I have a colleague that I work with and her last name is Hutter. And I cannot call her using my Alexa device because Alexa hears it as Hudson Hotter Hotel. Some other examples, and I'm actually gonna play you a recording. Um, I am at Towson University. I live in the Towson area. And just up to yesterday, I did this recording. If I ask um, what the weather is in Towson, this is often the response that I will get. Alexa, what's the weather in Towson? In Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's 69 degrees Fahrenheit with cloudy skies. Tonight, you can look for clouds with a low of 58 degrees. So uh, again, I asked Alexa if she could spell Towson because I'm interested in trying to figure out what it is that she's hearing when I say Towson and she gives me weather for, Tal for Tulsa. So I asked Alexa four times to spell Towson. Alexa, can you spell Towson? Toast is spelled T-O-A-S-T. 
Alexa, can you spell Towson? Towson is spelled T U L L S O N. Alexa, can you spell Towson? Chosen is spelled C H O S E N. Alexa, can you spell Towson? Towson is spelled T A U S A N. So you see the variations there that are offered to me. So in today's talk, I am hoping to answer five questions. You may have other questions um, for me at the end, but these are the, these are the five things that I, I want us to grapple with. Well, you might be wondering now, is accent bias really a thing? <laughs> and um, that's where I'm going to start my, my discussion. You may also be wondering, well, you know, there have been a lot of claims about speech technology being revolutionary. Can't we say that, that it in itself is a revolutionary thing? And aren't we seeing um, advances in the range of accents that and languages that are being recognized? So for example, English, aren't things changing? Um, and even if they weren't really, the fact that uh, Alexa can't spell thousand, I mean, who is that harming anyway? And I know that I'm speaking to a lot of um, young designers coming into the field. Well, what does any of this have to do with design? And so my call to action is going to be for you to start thinking about what I call a decolonized design agenda. And I am going to use an example from my own research um, on non-native speech and ask the question about the intelligibility or unintelligibility of that speech. So to answer my first question, yes, <laughs> accent bias is a thing. So I wanna start by defining what accent is. And an accent really is the manner of pronunciation. So you've already into the first 10 minutes have recognized that I say my words differently. Some things you may have picked up on, I don't pronounce R at the end of words. So the word water, for example, um, might be problematic for some of you. I say the word schedule, you may say schedule um, if you speak with an American accent. Um, I don't, I pronounce my T's in the middle of words, so I, you would hear me say water instead of water. So that's about accent. Accent is a manner of pronunciation. But accent is also about identity. It tells you where somebody is from. It tells you where they've grown up. It tells you about their mother tongue. It goes, it goes far beyond just how you pronounce a word and accent tells you about who that person is. And so when I say that accent bias is a thing, we can, when we talk about bias, we are simply talking about um, some preference um, for or against a particular language or accent. And that's not always a bad thing. So for example, the e evolutionary theory suggests that babies and children have a, a preference for their native tongue as a means of survival. It's, it's a way that you a part of a group to have a preference for the mother tongue. We also know that there are positive stereotypes that come out of um, listening to different accents. So I'm always tickled by the American um, a love of the British accent that it always sounds so educated. Um, I, I remember speaking to an Uber driver a couple of years ago who was American, but was his his GPS was set to um, to UK, a British accent. And when I asked him about it, he says, "I just feel like I'm going to get where I'm going with this with this GPS set to a British accent." So some some accents carry positive stereotypes, but non-native speech, and that is accents that are formed from speakers for whom a language is not their native language, that they are speaking um, a second or a third language with 
an accent, that kind of speech often faces negative perceptions. So there's research that shows that people who speak non-native accented speech are perceived to be more to perceived more negatively than speakers with native accents. We also have research that shows that the stronger the accent, meaning the further away it is from what is considered standard speech, the stronger the accent, the more negatively that individual is evaluated. We also know that non-native speakers of a language are considered to be less intelligent. They're considered to be less loyal. They're seen often as less competent. We also know that non-native speakers are often perceived as speaking the language poorly. You hear that complaint very often uh, with um, overseas, um, call centers. Very often we hear people complaining um, about the poor language of, of people who are helping them through their tech. That's another story. I, I, can, I can talk about that separately. Um, and then people who speak with an accent, a non-standard accent, a non-native accent, face discriminatory practices in housing, employment, in the courts, I, I'm thinking right now of um, what happened in the Trayvon Martin case and the fact that Rachel Gentil, who spoke what is called a broken English, which is problematic in itself, um, was seen to be a less than reliable witness. Um, the people with accents often face lower job status positions. So the answer is yes, accent bias is a thing. And I want to share with you my own personal experience. I received a student evaluation in 2017 at another institution. And I'm gonna read this with you. The student wrote at the end of the semester, um, in my teaching evaluation, I am going to be very harsh here but please don't be offended. Well, I think it's too late now. <laughs> Your accent is horrible. As a non-native speaker of English, I had a hard time understanding what you are saying. An example that sticks the most is that you say goal and I hear Google. While it, is while it was funny, at first it got annoying as the semester progressed. I was left with the impression that you are very proud of your accent. But I think that just like movie stars acting in movies and changing their accent, when you profess, you should try to speak clearly in a US accent so that non-native speakers can understand you better. I'm just gonna let that sit with you for a couple of seconds. <laughs> Every time I read this, it's a hard read. It feels very personal to me. And I should not have been surprised. Less than a year later, I came across this quotation from David Crystal, who's a renowned British linguist, who seems to be a guest on a polling program in England. And he said when he looked back at his time, of doing this work, he says about language, it was the extreme nature of language that always struck me. Listeners didn't just say they disliked something, they used the most emotive words that they could think of. They were horrified, appalled, dumbfounded, aghast, outraged when they heard something they didn't like. When I read that, this comment started to make more sense to me. I think there's an acceptability about the practice of accent bias that doesn't get challenged. As a matter of fact, I see accent bias is the last acceptable bias on which we can discriminate. And I'll tell you why I say that. I shared this with many people including people in administration at the time. And I did not get the same reaction 
that I would have gotten if this quotation, if this assessment was about my gender or about my race. People thought it was problematic, but they were horrified. <laughs> and I think it's because as speakers of a language, we can change our accents. We move be between accents, we move between dialects. And I think because we assume that people can do that, it is okay to ask that of somebody else. And I am saying to you today that I think that is violent. The fact that I can change my accent should be a choice that I make. It should not be put upon me. And the fact that we ask people to do that, and we're gonna see how in technology in a little while, is not only violent, it is perhaps one of the basic strategies of colonialism. To think about Europe pulling up to the shores of the Caribbean and colonizing their native people, the first thing that they do is address language, that language is stripped of people, that the ability to communicate in their native language is stripped of people that their education systems around which language is built get stripped. And so when our technologies are also stripping us of the ability to be able to speak in our native tongue, it is no different than a colonial experience. So the question is, what well, are speech technologies revolutionary? And one of the things that strikes me is that very often, I think within the last five years, if you see an article online about speech technologies in a tech magazine, that's the claim. The voice recognition revolution is here. The speech technologies are the new digital revolution. And so I looked up that word in Miriam Webster. It defines revolutionary constituting or bringing about a major or fundamental change. And so the question here is, what's the fundamental change? And I think there are some things. I think the arguments that have been made are valid points that speech technology is quick if you compare it to perhaps other forms of input, like a keyboard or a mouse, that it's natural, that speech is a natural thing that we don't, that, that speech technology is based on the premise of natural language, that it's more efficient, it's flexible for the user. So I can be standing a couple of meters away and I can say something to my speech device and my hands don't have to be engaged and my eyes don't have to be engaged. It's also said to be inclusive. So that people who have, for example, um, visual impairments can use speech technologies. So all, there are all of these wonderful arguments for why speech technologies might be considered revolutionary. But here's the catch. Ma Hicks in her work, Program Inequality, suggests to us that if a technology is re-inscribing bias, if a technology is re-inscribing bias, then it cannot be considered to be revolutionary. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, does speech technology re-inscribe bias? And if it does, how? Oh. I think it does so in two ways. And I have this quote here um, by Joy Bolognini, who says, whoever codes the system embeds the view, that we have to start from the point of accepting and understanding that we all have bias with regard to language. That there's an accent that sounds sweet to our ears. It's quite often our own mother tongue. And sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's another accent that we prefer. But the fact that we prefer one accent over the other is not the problem. It is when those preferences get encoded into our systems. 
And there are two things that we can look for when we ask the question, do our speech technologies reinscribe bias? One, you have to ask yourself, what are the range of accents that are available? What are the range of dialects, those ways of speaking? What is available on your device? And the second question you have to ask and answer is does your technology demand that speakers who aren't considered to be standard speakers of a language, are they being asked to assimilate so that they can engage with the technology? And as you recognized in my interaction with Alexa, if I am going to get Alexa to wake me up at 6.30, I have to see it differently. And so that, that bias gets reinscribed that there's considered to be some standard English that I have to be able to hit if I am going to engage with the technology. So the next question that I'm going to ask is, well, what's changing? You may have heard, I think it was last year or maybe year before, that um, Hinglish, which is a hybrid of the Hindi language and English, was being added to um, Amazon Alexa's roster of Englishes. And I've had so many people said to me, but that is progress. And I acknowledge that is progress. It's not considered to be one of the prestige Englishes like the UK or the US or the Australian or Canadian English, surely the representation of English um, indicates that big tech is beginning to be more inclusive and address the bias that we see in speech technologies. Well, I think it's important to understand um, that English is spoken by I think nearly 350 million people in India. And so, and in some cases, considered to be a prestige accent of its own, that it is spoken by the educated, it is spoken by a particular group of people in India. Um, and so English has to be understood within the context of a market and not under the lens of inclusion and diversity. It is about accessing a market of 350 million people who are tech savvy and wanting to hear their accent um, on these speech devices. Um, we need only look to see what Englishes have been developed to start seeing where the bias lies. There are more non-native speakers of English in the world than there are native speakers of English. But our technologies do not reflect that. So what I have circled here off to the right are the Englishes that are supported across uh, technologies like Alexa, sorry, Alexa, Siri, um, Google Home, and you'll see those Englishes are typically spoken by descendants of Europeans, United Kingdom, United States, Australian English, New Zealand English, um, Irish English, Anglophone, uh, Canadian English. Um, you also have now, you're starting to see a movement towards um, English pigeons and creoles. So the Hinglish, the South African English, for examples, and most recently, the addition of Singaporean English, which would be considered coming from a non-native or indigenized variety of English. But the real focus of development of big tech has been the English that has uh, come out of Europe. Well, the question is, who is it harming? I mean, the fact, like I said earlier, that um, that Siri or Alexa can't spell, you know, the city that I live in. Is that a big deal? Just last week, or maybe two weeks ago, um, there was a study that was released from Stanford and the New York Times reported on this, um, 
this study. And what Stanford researchers found, unsurprisingly, is that when they, uh, when they measured the accuracy of speech, um, looking at white speakers, American speakers, and Black American, African American speakers, that there was a word error rate, that's what the WER stands for, a word error rate of 19%, um, so that 19% of the words spoken by white Americans um, were not understood by these devices. And there was a disproportionately higher number, 35%, of these words were not recognized um, if they were spoken by African-American speakers. And so the article that came out in the uh, New York Times is that there's a racial divide in speech recognition systems. And that's what the, that's what the research showed, that when you compare African-American speech to, um, to uh, speakers, white American speakers, that the error rates were significantly different. The problem with this analysis is if we say that there's a racial divide, and there is, but if we leave the problem at simply being a racial divide, and you say, well, we need to train our systems on African-American speech, it's also called African-American vernacular, then you've addressed a Black problem, you have not addressed a language problem. You've addressed a, a race problem, but you have not addressed a language problem. Because you could find there are a number of, and there are a number of African Americans who don't speak AABE, and who can interact very easily with these devices. What you want to be able to look at is say, what are the languages and the accents that are not represented at this table? When you begin thinking more inclusively about the range of accents, you begin taking care of the race problem that gets often elevated and publicized. Well, why is this a problem? Why is it that in America, that you have word error recognition rates of 35%? Well, it has a lot to do with where these technologies are being deployed. So for example, um, More and more, I don't know if you've seen an article recently, but more and more we're finding that um, these devices are being deployed in schools and in prison to detect certain kinds of speech, like angry speech, emotional speech. If African-American voices or African-American vernacular is not being represented in these devices, and these devices aren't recognizing them. It is, it is more than likely that these voices are going to be flagged as being more aggressive, more angry, more vitriolic. And these groups are already disproportionately represented in our prison systems. So there is a need to look to see what is the, about the range of accents that are being represented on devices if we are going to start deploying them as surveillance systems in, in public spaces. So what does this have to do with design? Well, I want to challenge us to start thinking about a decolonized design agenda. What I mean by decolonized is simply to start thinking about moving away from a white, uh, patriarchal, West 
Western perspective about language. That English that is spoken in the Midwest, for example, doesn't have to be considered a standard. That as you look across the spaces that we occupy, that all language is legitimate, that all language is valued. And I am suggesting that as you as young designers can start asking really critical questions, practical questions when it comes to design. Who is at the table making design decisions? Which voices get represented in the corpora that we are training these devices on? Whose voices get recognized? Who is designing and coding these technologies? And which user groups are we testing our technologies with? Towards a decolonized design agenda, we should also be asking some philosophical questions. What are the potential unintended environments that these, these um, devices are going to be deployed? When people are designing, when you are designing your device, are you thinking about the other environments that your device, your design is going to be used? With the design of the speech technology thinking that these would be used as surveillance devices in prisons? And if so, would they have designed them differently? What is the potential for exploitation and by whom? I mean, there's been a, a storm of protest um, about Zoom, <laughs> the platform that we're using right now, because we're starting to see weaknesses in the design that have not been considered and are being exploited. As designers, we have to ask ourselves, what are our own biases? And more specifically, what are our language biases? We have to also ask ourselves, are we thinking paternalistically about technology? Or do we have what Ruha Benjamin calls a socially informed skepticism? This paternalistic thinking that somehow the technology is going to save us, that once it's digitized, we can solve this problem. Do we have really practical uh, reasons why something should not be designed? We have to ask ourselves, technology is not going to solve every communication problem that we have. I think it's also important as young designers to think about what research is grounding and driving our design decisions. Who are we reading? Where are we being informed as we start thinking about the design decisions that we make? And I wanted to end um, by sharing an example of my own research that helps sort of inform um, my work, and I'm hoping informs the work of others. As part of my own dissertation, I was very interested because I wasn't hearing accented speakers on public address systems. I started wondering, listen, would it be terribly problematic if an accented speaker made an announcement on a peer system, on a, on a train station? Um, and so I set up a study to to have people listen to accented speech and complete a series of tasks. I, I had them listen to it in their own accent, and then I had them listen to it in two other accents, non-native accents. And I found three really important things. That the talker's accent, the person who was speaking, did not have a significant effect on the listener's performance of a task. I also found that there was a significant effect on listeners' accents and how and talkers and talkers' accents. That means if the listener and the talker had two different accents, 
the task took a little bit longer, but the task got accomplished. And the third thing that I discovered is that the accent did have a significant effect on the listener's ability to recall information. That just means that when you leave here, you probably will not remember anything that I've said. Uh, and that's why we're recording it. That actually isn't bad news. It means that there are some tasks and some content that you can design using non-native speech, but it just means that maybe you need additional scaffolding for your users or your listeners to be successful. So maybe there's visual support, or maybe there needs to be longer processing time to get a banking um, activity completed, or maybe you repeat certain things to reinforce an idea. But what's the benefit? Why should we be hearing accented speakers on our devices? Because as we hear accents, listeners begin, it becomes normal. They begin to hear accented speech in everyday context. And what we also know is that work by Rubin suggests that improve, there's an improved comprehension of accented speech. It starts to sound normal to our ears. And we also see most importantly, a changed attitude towards accented speakers. So I'm gonna end here. I'm gonna leave this slide up for a little while. It's a reading list for you um, of work if you're interested. It's um, by a couple of really amazing researchers who have not only been concerned about sort of the broader ideas of bias and algorithms, bias and, and artificial intelligence. Um, their work looks at issues of race in particular and asks that really important question, who is being marginalized? Who doesn't get to be represented? who does not get to be heard. So I'm gonna end my talk here and thank you. I'm hoping that we can have some discussion based on the ideas that I just shared. I'm gonna hand it back over to uh, Sue, I believe is going to field some questions for us at this time. Here we are. We had, uh, we were just trying to manage the, the load on the system a little bit. So we shut okay. some video down. Okay. But everybody's been here the whole time, just not right. sharing video. Um, and uh, I guess, uh, assuming the streaming is still going, we can invite some questions uh, from uh, from Facebook. Uh, Sarah, do you do you, do we have some some questions coming? In? Yeah. So I have. Um, I mean, I think my favorite question was uh, when you projected the student eval. Um, it was who wrote that, <laughs> and I think we all are like, yes, who wrote that. Um, but a more perhaps sincere question in terms of um, dealing with the content. Um, mm. And I have been getting kicked off this call periodically. Um, so in yeah, the event that that happens, <laughs> yeah. um, hopefully someone else can pick this up. So this question comes from um, Amen Tochi, I believe is the um, pronunciation. I apologize if I'm um, saying that incorrectly. Um, and it says, the prices of many devices, phones, cars, computers, et cetera, are reliant on the technologies that accompany them. If you can't use these devices because the device doesn't recognize your voice, does any company offer a discount? I think of this scenario also <laughs> <laughs> for the deaf or hard of hearing community. Um, mm. Some may talk, but the device will not understand them at all. Mm. So a discount should definitely be offered for a defect in the technology. <laughs> it's not inclusive for some um, quote unquote minorities. Mm. And it says, I'm running to a Zoom meeting, but hopefully I'm back before Q&A. If not, I'll watch the recording. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, one of the challenges, of course, is that we are operating in a highly unregulated um, tech environment. So there are little protections for the consumer. Um, we're constantly discovering the ways in which our, our um, privacy is um, 
being eroded, um, the way that information is being shared, that we are seeing more and more when you hear these depositions that our legislators have no idea how this thing works. And so part of the challenge is that right now is that big, it's a free for all for big tech. Very difficult to sort of find any sort of um, recourse um, on the basis of discrimination in these areas, because let's go back to the beginning, the standards don't exist. Mm -hmm. so we're seeing, for example, I believe there was an increase, uh, almost a 300% increase in the number of um, cases of people bringing lawsuits against um, companies who have websites in commercial, like, I, I believe it was it was Domino's that lost a case last year. Mm -hmm. um, the claims that these um, websites aren't accessible for people with disabilities. Well, what does that mean for the deployment of speech technology? Are we going to see people just moving to well, let's just let's just do speech text to speech, and, and we'll have that as as to to fix the problem? Well, that's unregulated and that's untested. Um, and I think we're going to see until we can start seeing standards and us advocating for standards. Um, what does it mean, for example, that speech technology is not inclusive in the way that we can make that argument about a website or about a visual artifact? So, um, and again, it goes back to that idea that I don't think we've engaged with the, with the notion that speech and sound can be designed. Yeah. Um, actually, if uh, there's none on the Facebook stream right now, um, I have a question related to that because I have some experience from a project I did uh, four or five years ago, uh, actually creating uh, voice commands in a 3D environment. And so um, I, I think that most people don't realize that the process uh, is in fact one of comparison. So you essentially on the making side, you have access to a library. Mm -hmm. of speech, path, of, of words, uh, sound yeah, spoken. Yeah. And, yeah. and as you mm -hmm. say, right, that's very much, I liked your comment, there's no negotiation with technology in that sense, right? Because if it's not in the database, it cannot recognize the word. Um, and so I'm curious, I mean, is there a, a way that you en envision how this might um, might become mm -hmm. more inclusive? Because we had terrible trouble, uh, even with um, speakers involved in the project who would be close to the accent it was looking for, uh, to the point where we had a word uh, that was essentially exit uh, from a screen to go back to the virtual world. And we had to change that word for a conference to tuna because exit sounded too like other words and, and it would you know exit uh, unexpectedly quite often uh, because we didn't have a place to test it. So we were testing it in an office and people would walk by the hallway and say things and would mm. shut off the, the program. So that was my first exposure to this and and i'm really curious now uh, as i think about it more um what might um be a way to get at more inclusivity in this because mm. this is kind of the secret that people don't know is that it's a a comparison <laughs> and it's checking against it all the time and so i'm, I'm curious yeah. uh, have you thought I'm, I'm sure you've thought about it a lot like what that, <laughs> might, what that might be like absolutely so, so a couple of things i i want to just pin I may not have explained this clearly enough, just sort of thinking back about the negotiation that I talked earlier about the fact that when I am, when I am in a human-human communication situation, that negotiation happens. It's a mutual negotiation. I get to make choices. I lose agency with a device like Alexa because she's not negotiating with me because that match isn't happening. That, the, that pronunciation where I form my vowels in my mouth, that doesn't match anything in her database. And therefore I cannot participate in a conversation um, with the device. So we have to then start asking about the corporas on which these um, platforms are trained. And for the almost 50, 55, 60 years of speech technologies, they've been in the US um, trained on a Midwestern corpora, <laughs> sort of, you know, your standard Midwestern accent. 
that is not representative of the way the majority of this uh, of this country speaks. So corporates are expensive <laughs> um, to accumulate and big tech is not interested in sharing those with us. It is expensive for them to expand, which is one of the reasons why we're seeing such a slow movement of these languages and these accents. I argue that that kind of inclusivity is going to come outside of big tech. Big tech is being driven by the profit margin. That's, what, that's why English exists. If we are going to see any sort of development of accents like my own, I come from an island of 1.5 million people. There's really no market for it. <laughs> um, I'm not terribly hopeful, but an independent developer, <laughs> students who are interested in hearing their accents represented on these devices, working with open source projects. And I mm -hmm. hear that uh, Mozilla has an uh, open source project called One Voice that's encouraging um, people all over the world to leave and share their voices with recordings, that they're building an open source corpora that we can possibly start um, access. Well, access is there to be able to start training um, devices, but it's not going to come from big tech. It is, it is really, I think, going to come from independent developers who want um, their language represented. It's the same problem that we have with the internet. I mean, we look at, you know, the representation of English language on the internet, not in any way representative of, of, of the range of, of languages that are spoken throughout the world. That English language bias is strong in tech. Um, Question? <laughs> yeah, so we've got some more coming in through the yeah. comment feed. Um, so I'm just going to read them as they come in. So um, Daniel Hasty asks, um, who's a linguist in our department, um, asks, why do you only um, focus on accent uh, or phonology? What about other issues with language at other levels of the grammar, like the lexicon or the syntax? Yes, excellent question. Very linguist question. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dina. <laughs> um, interesting that you asked that. That's exactly where my uh, research is taking me this year. I'm, I'm sort of really happy that that study out of Stanford was done. I certainly wouldn't have the kind of money to pull off the research that they did at the, at the Stanford um, research that focused on um, the phonology, the, the uh, acoustic phonology. I am interested in, it, so it's been established. We now have research that says, listen, there's a race problem. There's you know, not enough representation for African-American vernacular. I am actually interested in those other um, linguistic markers. So is it just an acoustic um, phonetic problem or is it a lexical problem? Can I say something using a Trinidadian term, a, a, a dialect, a word, um, and have that represented or will that also be kicked out? I am also interested in seeing the range of um, the range of linguistic changes that a speaker must make to assimilate to this device. Because what I think is happening, and this is, is purely anecdotal, and that's where my research is taking me this year. What I think is happening is that to speak a standard English, to, to interact with the device also means that we have to give up other linguistic markers beyond just the, just the, the way that we pronounce words. Um, so I'm hoping to do that, that research by looking to see how would you say this if you were talking to somebody as opposed to how would you say this if you were asking Alexa to get it done? I think that lexical um, distinction is going to be really, really important to make the argument that this is, this speaks to our identity and who we are and what we have to give up to be able, 
um, to interact with speech devices. I hope that answers your question, Dina. Um, yeah, when you were talking about that, I was just thinking of that um, viral video that I don't, was like a year or so ago of the little girl asking Alexa to play Baby Shark um, and treating Alexa as if she could understand, you know, like the three, uh, she's like three or four years old, right? So as if she can understand this four-year-old, um, but then needing the like adult intervention who knows how to talk to a machine to mm -hmm. kind of do the, the work of um, adjusting that request to be like, Alexa, play baby, you know, um, and really kind of overdo it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And then, but we do have another question um, from the feed. And this is from um, Tripti, who is um, a professor, a literature professor in our department. And she says, um, thank you for your talk. Could you comment on the concept of mimicry and exoticism in the context of accented speakers and post in neo-colonial, coca-colonial praxis? Um, in particular, I'm thinking of the complexities of how we are able to pick an accented speaker, elite and non-elite accents are available to navigate us on MapQuest-like environments. Mm. Wow, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, Sarah, can I ask just to read the first part of it again? Yes. Um, can you comment on the concept of mimicry and exoticism? in the context of act accented speakers and post in neo-colonial coca-colonial praxis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mimicry and exoticism. Um, so one of the things that, one of the things that strikes me about the way, or why I describe speech technology as being imperialist um, is bound up in the way in which there's an expectation of mimicry, <laughs> that there's something very inauthentic about asking a non-native speaker of a language or a non-standard accented speaker of a language, even using sort of that term is, for me, problematic. Um, that there's something very inauthentic to ask somebody um, to change their accent or to mimic another accent to be able to engage um, with a device. Um, I, I hadn't thought about sort of this idea of exoticism and I'm not sure if the question is sort of, is sort of pointing towards, um, I'm not, I'm not sure where that exoticism is centered, but that idea of mimicry stands out to me. My own personal experience is that if I have to make any sort of linguistic changes to inter interact with the device, it feels false. It feels inauthentic. I feel silly doing it. Um, and that is not just with the devices. I, I'm talking about my normal, if I am in a, in a, a a store, or a restaurant, and I want a glass of water, that to see water just feels very inauthentic um, to me. And so um, it reminds me of the ways in which I experienced sort of neo-colonialism in, in, in the Caribbean, um, that in my island of Trinidad and Tobago, that I can still walk down streets that are named Abercrombie and, and Sean Sri Lee, and, and that there's Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles streets, and you know, that there is, there are these very not so subtle reminders of colonialism. Um, and that language is has always been one of those ways in which um, we the ways in which colonial masters have subjugated people. So that when I am asked to mimic, when I am asked by this device to engage with it, to mimic another's language, it feels really, really violent to me. So I think, um, I don't see any other questions coming in, but I think the other half of, of Tripti's question, um, and Tripti by all means drop back into the comment thread if I'm doing this <laughs> wrong, um, is also about um, the way that our devices speak to us. Cause she mentions mm. like the ability to choose um, an accented speaker to give you um, your instructions through Google maps or something 
Um, yeah. So I think it's also asking about the other side of it and the exoticism in that, um, like choose your own accent. Kind oh, of yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. I think that's where those prestige accents tend to rear their, rear their heads. I mean, my one anecdote about a, uh, um, about an Uber driver using um, a British accent. I mean, I, I see it and I hear it all, all of the time. Um, at a design level, I think that's exactly how we would argue. Um, good design would give your user freedom of choice and flexibility of choices. Um, but it's also problematic if the if the range of accents aren't available. So it's not just for me, not just that my speech isn't recognized. It's also problematic that I don't hear my language um, when I, I circle through these options. Um, I will say that it's a double-edged sword and my own research is pushing me and my, my colleagues are pushing me to think about the double-edged sword nature of these options. Um, at a, a, a conference about a year and a half ago, one of my colleagues asked, given the fact that these devices are being used as tools of surveillance, do we really want marginalized groups um, represented in a corpora? <laughs> Is that not going to lead us towards yeah. exploitation? Um, I think, and, and that's a question that just sort of stopped me in my tracks. Um, about thinking about design, thinking about the, 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 the sort of the choices that we make and the kind of flexibility that we want to build into our, into our devices that that in itself can be exploited. Yeah, I would um, just um, to carry this kind of outside of even, because uh, one of the things I've been thinking about while you're talking, because, you know, this is so wonderfully and it's, it's, it's fabulous for, uh, our student population too, to be thinking about this as design. But uh, uh, Tripti's question about exoticism and some of what you were talking about in decolonizing, you know, from a Western perspective, we are so obsessed with the visual. We are so obsessed with the textual. And of course we've come back to the visual, right? And, you know, with Instagram, these kinds of things, they're very visual mediums. We don't think about the sonic. We don't think about sound really at all. Um, I was thinking about a film I was watching the other night and I was comparing it kind of to, I don't know how many I've seen this way where the exotic moment of being in a foreign place is this cacophony of sound, right? Where everything gets noisy and loud, right? Everything gets noisy and loud and that it's its own sort of exoticizing, right? You know, it's like you go from the quiet. Yes, right. So I guess out of that, one of the things that I would, I would ask, and I think you, you maybe pointed to this with your, um, uh, wonderful bibliography, but what are some other ways outside of design where we can start to push our research in the mm -hmm. direction of decolonizing critique away from the visual and the textual and towards the sonic? Hmm. That's a good question, Jen. I, in my field, I have been pushing my colleagues in my field to think about um, and maybe uh, to think about and perhaps problematically as well the ways in which there are analogous ideas um, the, the ways in which there are analogous ideas and concepts about the textual and about the visual that exist in um, the realm of speech. Yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah. That, I'll give you one example. When we think about, um, when we think about an image or a piece of text, we could use a term and say that something isn't legible, that I can't, I can't, I can't make out the characters on this page. This font is problematic, it's not legible. Well, is there an analogous idea in speech and sound? And yes, there is. It's called intelligibility. The, mm -hmm. the sound to be designed in a way that is discernible. And I think that, that fields like ours that have done this wonderful work in text and, and visual design, um, and not just for print, but for, for the digital as well, have to start thinking 
one, that we already in some ways have the expertise to start thinking about these sonic um, spaces and that we can learn from the kinds of challenges that we've had with designing um, for, the, for textual and um, visual spaces, that there are lessons that we already can start we, the, we don't have to go down the same road right, <laughs> in, right. and the same kinds of mistakes. And so that's, I am very interested in the ways in which we can build a bridge quickly to the design of, of, of sound because of the wealth of expertise that we have um, with other, other types of texts. Does that? Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, thank you. Answer, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so Tripti mentioned in the comment thread having another question and I wanted <laughs> to come up. <laughs> uh, so keep typing Tripti. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Jen and Sue, do y'all have um, other kind of pressing questions? Yeah, and we should probably, we don't want to, uh, this has been such a fascinating and amazing talk. We could probably keep Hal on here for a day, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but we do want to probably <laughs> create a, a point where maybe we'll say, uh, should we say another, um, I don't know, seven minutes or so of letting questions come in if they do, and then we should let Hal uh, move on to what I'm sure is a very busy schedule like ours, these yeah. days, like <laughs> teaching and other kinds of... <laughs> This just this shows you how fascinating this topic is, is yeah. that we've not yeah. only had pe many people uh, tuning in, but the questions that are coming. Yeah, in. that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do have a question while we wait for a trip. Day. Um, and this is kind of about other research maybe that you've seen um, mm -hmm. or other conversations you've seen in this area, Hal. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, and you may have mentioned this when I was kicked off the call, <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that kind of been through this is the uh, use of speech recognition um, interfaces like these as an accessibility tool, right? For allowing um, mm -hmm. users with visual impairments, for instance, to access um, the tech in various ways. Um, so I am wondering, is there any push from like ADA or from WCAG or from these more um, like professional guidance groups um, to be considering sound within as like a, a need um, and like the range of accents and making sure that our sound design is good um, mm -hmm. as an accessibility tool, right? And as an accessibility cause. Yeah. I was surprised WCAG uh, did quite a bit of work and then just stopped. And I think it's coming up on eight or nine years um, that they've stopped doing any sort of work with regard to speech and sound mm -hmm. standards. Um, I'm, I've raised the concern already that given the number of lawsuits that are starting to roll in against, um, we're starting to see a range of industries that are being sued um, because their websites are inaccessible that, I, I, that I'm concerned that we're going to just sort of slap some um, text to speech mm -hmm. to and, and call it a day just to avoid the lawsuits. Um, which is why I say that we have to have a more robust um, legislative um, process that is, and, and, and that is starting to think about these things holistically. Um, so the, the problem is the standards don't exist. Um, and yeah. the, these like WCAG are still very often seen as just nice recommendations. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. You know, the fact that Domino's, for example, even thought that they could go to court to argue that, that ordering pizza online is not the same as, it, you know, it shouldn't sort of fall under the, the banner of um, what, what, you know, maintaining an environment that is similar to somebody going to a brick and mortar store is in 20, 2019, I just think is absolutely, you know, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But we are, <laughs> here we are. And so in the absence of, of any sort of robust legislation, I, I think it's, it's going to be more and more problematic, coupled with the fact that we're starting to see these devices being used as surveillance tools. Mm -hmm. 
um, I, I think it's, we're heading towards a perfect storm. So, uh, Tripthi had texted me and said she had gotten <laughs> knocked. She had gotten knocked off, and I have noticed this. So this is something to talk about in terms of uh, Facebook tends to do this when you start to go over an hour. Uh, uh, they start to kind of push people off a little bit. To allow, yeah, I've, I've seen it happen now a couple times. They, there's nothing out there when you Google it that says that this is actually a practice. But I had told her to uh, text me back, but I have not seen anything come up. So I just saw it come uh, up in the comments. Um, okay, good. Okay, actually, yeah. So it's right, so uh, we'll end, well, says, how about we end on this one? This would be great. On this okay. one, great. Um, and this is a good one to end on. Um, so Tripti asks um, if there's any work being done on decolonizing design practices in other imperial languages, um, thinking of French and Arabic specifically. I, I am not aware that that work is being done with regard to speech technologies. Um, I am aware with regard to Arabic that there is work being done again by an independent developer um, who has been, um, whose work has been trying to move away from English code um, to be able to develop Arabic code of mm -hmm. um, Ramzi Nasser. Um, I can I can post uh, um, and I often talk about his work. I sh I should have done that earlier. Um, and he's he also has a couple of of um, really wonderful explanations about one why that's important to him as a as a developer, but two just the length that he is going to in this design process to um, to code in Arabic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I am. I can only speak to to his work, but I would love to hear about. Um, and if anybody out there listening is aware of other other work, please um, let me know. That would be really interesting. Again, um, that work is not specific to speech technologies, but it is about sort of thinking about um, being language bias in technology general. Yeah. To which trip the replies. Ramsey Nasser exclamation, yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Clapping. Yeah. Clapping going on too. Yeah, lots of snapping. Lots of snapping. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, well, this has been absolutely fabulous. Um, and I will, uh, I will let um, Sarah close us out completely. But let me just say that uh, this will be available as a recording yeah. in two different places. Um, so it will be a teaching resource for people that I think will be fabulous. I know I'm going to use it uh, yeah. in my theory course, probably in the fall, should fall materialize. <laughs> um, and uh, I just, I want to, I want to thank you so much for this because it's just, it's a, a fabulous contribution to the series. And I'm so delighted we were uh, able to do this. And Sarah, closing, closing. Um, yeah, I mean, just to echo, thank you so much, Halcyon, for joining us um, today and for everybody um, who's been on Facebook Live and even those of you who have left. So we'll maybe come back to the recording and see that you've been thanked um, for having to go to other places. But um, thanks so much for this um, really fantastic talk. And yeah, I was actually just thinking how much this fits in with um, my opening unit in Intro to DH or Intro, intro to um, ECD as it's soon to be the Intro to the Major course um, that has to do with understanding how bias gets coded into tech in various ways. Um, so it'll be a nice addition to think audibly um, since I tell them audibly, but you know, it'll be nice to have another another space, right? So, yes, <laughs> so thank you so much, um, Hal, for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and let me just leave yeah leave our designers with a challenge to go back to one thing that you have designed um, this, this year and to pick it up and to look at it, um, to read it over and to ask yourself, what are the biases that I have encoded in, uh, into this um, design and to, and to get into the habit of exposing those biases is really, really important. So thank you very much. It's fabulous. Creating and for I'm engaging with my week. I'm very grateful. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. We'll end the meeting on that and we'll see you on the other side and record it. Everyone, please take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.